Welcome to the Future of Supply Chain, presented by Dynamo. In each episode, we sit down with leaders in the industry as we build the future of supply chain together. Let's get into the show. Here's our host, Santosh Sankar. Hey, ladies and gents, welcome back to the Future Supply Chain Podcast. I'm your host, Santosh Sankar, and joining me today is a man who needs no intro in supply chain, Ryan Peterson, co-founder, CEO of Flexport. Welcome. Hey, it's great to be here. <laughs> um, so ordinarily, I kind of go through this, like, tell me who you are, you know, what you're building, kind of what you're focused on. Flexport's a household name. Uh, to your credit, uh, I think for most people uh, who are involved in sitting around supply chain, and I'd argue even kind of those who are um, kind of thinking about their consumer spending, their their e-com activity. So with that, I'm going to kind of jump right into the conversation, if that's cool with you, um, and a, a bit of a recap of this year, because I, I think... Um, You've had a very unique year as you've kind of navigated uh, company building. And uh, in late 22, you announced plans, uh, ultimately transitioned out of day-to-day, appointed uh, a new CEO in Dave Clark. And that didn't go as planned. It's, it's what it is. You've stepped back into the CEO role, um, and you're now steering the ship forward at Flexport, no pun intended. And... You're also, I guess, as you're coming in, you've made a lot of changes uh, very publicly at that as you think about how you've managed your organization. We have two M&A um, kind of uh, targets that you're now digesting in delivering Convoy. And they've each had kind of their own opportunities, challenges. And I present all this because I'm kind of wondering... How are you approaching now this next phase of Flexport's growth on the backdrop of your core business, seeing lower rates, lower volumes, and kind of steering through all that turbulence? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's exciting times. Um, we're, you asked, you know, how am I managing it? Well, it's probably the same way as usual. A few big changes in my own mentality, behavior, which is really about what we focus on. And I think... Um, Spending, I, I've joined Founders Fund as a as a partner as well, and it's get, which is one of the top venture capital firms out there, and and it's given me a really good fresh perspective on not that I never thought about Flexport from an investor's perspective, but when you just, you know when you're really part of the team that's doing that, looking at companies all day, you, you take a new a little bit of a different approach, and and I think balancing those is good. It's and I guess the, the big difference is it's really about return on invested capital at the margin, you know, like what's that next dollar of spend going to return to the company? And then looking at really all the dollars of spend and going, Hey, how, how does this add value for customers in a way that gives you a competitive advantage that allows you to earn excess returns? Let's call it, that allows you to make a higher return on invested capital. Um, so that, that has meant, now I still come back to the way I've always managed the company, which is obsessed on customers, how you drive quality, how you define measure, and drive quality results for the customers. We have we have made two pretty important acquisitions. Uh, one of those we made kind of in, I want to say April of this year, we closed the deal, maybe March of this year. We negotiated it for a while, so I can't remember the exact date of the close. But um, we, we, we brought that team on in April. Uh, that's the Shopify Logistics Group, which we've, uh, and it, they had acquired a company called Deliver, yeah. which is um, now Flexport Omnichannel. So this is our uh, last mile sort of fulfillment, retail distribution, and last mile network. Uh, focused on the United States now, but we're going to take it global over the next few years. Um, and then we acquired Convoy, which is digital truck brokerage um, with 400,000 drivers on a mobile app. I, well, I, I didn't realize until we got um, involved in, in the acquisition talk, just how much technology they'd actually built. Um, I knew mm-hmm. I knew Dan, I knew the business we'd partnered with them, but to see the level of to just get it, managing four hundred thousand drivers in a compliant, secure way, the cargo security, the amount of um, you know running kind of like six different background checks on every load every time they assign, assign a driver, anytime the driver veers off the assigned route, uh, making sure that you know it sends an alert to security. Um, so both of those offer really awesome things for Flexport. One way to think of that strategy is that it's a one-stop shop. You can ship anything, anywhere, in any quantity, by any mode. 
um, as as one of the core parts of Flex Sports Vision. Another way to talk about it is true end to end, where you know from order placing that order out to your factories, receiving that order from your customers, placing a replenishment order to the factories around the world, uh, and then delivering it all the way back to those customers' hands. That's like true order to cash lifecycle that we can manage for, for customers. So the strategy, those things were both in the vision. I think they were things that, you know, given how hard core freight forward, global freight forwarding, our core business is, I had sort of said, yeah, we'll get to that in, you know, five or 10 years. But when acquisition opportunities like that come along um, and Flexport being a pretty good place from a balance sheet uh, and, and leadership standpoint to be able to take that kind of th- those deals on, it was kind of a must do, even though, yeah, we are going through a lot of core transformations as I come back to the company. Well, one of those came, one of those we did with Dave and uh, Convoy came uh, just did a few weeks ago. And, and I would add, like, Convoy was specifically just the technology also that you ended up purchasing. Um, technology we we acquired the technology it's a technology company um and around we hired 50 of the top engineers you know the the ones that we thought could really build and uh, extend the system um so we feel pretty good about that we we, oh and we brought on some of the sales group you know so we're gonna we're gonna sales and account management group um we're talking to customers talking to carry it's mostly mom and pop carriers um 400,000 drivers with 60,000 carriers. So you can look at the ratio and see, oh, okay, it's mostly almost small, all small four or five truck carrier kind of thing. Um, so we are going to light the business back up. Um, and uh, timeline for that is TBD, but not that far in the future. We're, we're aiming for Q1, um, bring back some of the good customers, turn back on the marketplace. Awesome. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, I, I expect, you know, we acquired the technology, but I think we're going to get more than the technology as we bring that back to life. Sure. And so as you've, you you, you said, you always had this end to end vision and given the the strength of your balance sheet and the opportunities that you were faced with, right. um, Was part of capitalizing and acting on these opportunities presented to you informed by kind of being active as an investor as well and being able to kind of see something more holistically. And really what you've done is like you've accelerated the, the the TAM that you're ultimately going after and solving this, that customer pain point more holistically? Um, no, the, these two particular acquisitions are both, they came to Flexport because of personal relationships I built over many years. Um, and uh, in specific with the CEOs of Shopify and with Convoy, um, became friends with them. And so... Okay. I, you know, I, I, maybe you could tangentially say, oh, I'm an investor, I meet more people or something. But no, I've, got, I've known these guys since way before I was a venture capitalist. Um, and uh, yeah, both cases. Well, in the in the Shopify case, uh, Toby called me, wanted to, was looking for a better way to drive the Shopify logistics, uh, now Flexport Omnichannel, drive that business faster. Saw the expertise we have on our team in, in logistics um, and saw what a good combo it is, is there so they can go more focus on e-commerce. Uh, and so that um, that's where that deal came from. The Convoy one, you know, I called Dan um, not to acquire the company. Honestly, I called to check in on it. My uh, friends with the guy, I was like, oh man, this is, you know, they, they had just kind of effectively shut down the business. And um, I, yeah, I called him to see how he's doing. And, um, and then quickly be, he introduced us to the bank because uh, it was at that point they had taken on some venture debt and it was bank owned. Um, yeah. So then we called the deal was negotiated, not with Dan, but with the bank. Dan kind of facilitated the intro, but. Yeah. So you've made mention over the last several months, like your, your ambition still is eventually over a period of time uh, to return to profitability. Flexport has been profitable in the recent past. Uh, and I think even kind of your most recent uh, interview with the journal, uh, you made mention of that. But you ultimately do also want to, you know, take this company public. It has also been a statement you've made. So w- with that in mind, kind of what are the the focal points? Like what what is top of mind? You've you've certainly been extremely customer obsessed, and I think that is clearly one ingredient to the recipe for success. But are there other things that you're prioritizing as you're going through this kind of 
growth stage, mid growth stage, late growth stage uh, as a business? Pro those are both output metrics, profitability. It will certainly go public. And then also, uh, you know, even profitability is an output metric. Um, but we mostly focus on input metrics while, while checking the output metrics every day. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of a good way to manage a company. Um, what, what the, and some things, not everything can be measured. Not everything that's important in this world can be measured. Uh, right. the, the first area, and you can measure it, but, but it's often a feeling, is, your, is the culture of the company. Because um, fundamentally, that's the competitive advantage that we drive, is having better people who are better organized, doing better work you know, at higher velocity than the competition. Um, and that is the goal of a culture. It's not this like wishy-washy thing. It's like, you got it drive velocity uh, towards our towards our mission, towards our purpose, which is making global commerce easier for everybody. We want to make global commerce so easy that there's there's more of it. Um, we think that would be very good for the world. It's not it doesn't have to be some high minded over saving the world kind of thing. It's like just help businesses run better. It's obvious how that will uh, help our customers businesses run better. That's obvious how that will make the world a better place because they'll hire more people. They'll make more money. We'll create opportunity. Like, so it's, it's, it's pretty easy to get people pumped about the mission at Flexport. Um, and then, yeah, the, the goal of the culture is to drive velocity, which if you remember from your physics class, velocity is different from speed. Uh, velocity has a vector. So it's uh, speed in the right direction. Sometimes you're yep. changing directions back in supply chain. And logistics, you're changing directions a lot. Like, you know, it's like week to week, there's new kind of chaotic circumstances happening, especially on the global side um, with like missiles hitting ships and trade wars yep. and what you never know what's going to happen. It's a fun industry. Um, so the culture piece, how do you drive velocity in the culture? Um, well, it's having the right people in, a, in an org structure that lets them do a lot of work without too much bureaucracy. Uh, it, it's it's um, from there, it's really about trust like building trust between leadership and the front line and between all the other, the teams, you know, uh, uh, that are working, that have to, that have to work together and it should work together. Um, so building trust, doing the things that you say you're going to do is a really um, simple way to, to talk about that. We do, we're, do, we're, we're doing a lot more than I getting back to the way, excuse me, getting back to the way that we often did things, um, which is, or that we that we did things earlier in our life stage, which is being really transparent, as transparent as we can be around where we are as a business, what are our goals, what are people working on, try to break down silos. Um, so that that's the trust piece. I build a culture of learning. Like we really want to get people excited about the very fact supply chain is the best industry to learn about. If you like business, like you should work in a supply chain company because yep. you get to see how all the other businesses are run. Uh, you're a backstage pass to the, to the world economy and see what's going on and how, how you can, and then you get to Love get in that. the game. Unlike, unlike fans, you know, I'm a fan of business, but unlike a fan, I get to like get in the game sometimes and help people with their business. So it's pretty, it's an awesome industry. Um, so we get try, we try to get people really excited about the learning opportunities that that creates. Um, we want to, we want to be good at making decisions. Um, I think a lot of cultures suffer from decision, either going too slow or making bad decisions. Um, and so that balancing that sometimes you got to go really fast and sometimes you got to delegate decisions. Sometimes the CEO needs to make a handful of decisions, uh, or leadership the, the, the ones that can't be reversed should be made by senior people with a lot of judgment and experience. Um, so you gotta be, you gotta be good at, at making decisions. You gotta have focus and direction. So that was one of your early things where you focus on, um, for us focus right now is definitely, uh, it, it is the culture itself, but it's a uh, culture of quality, delivering quality results for the, for the customer. Um, and that can be measured pretty precisely. It's on time performance. It's your response time when people ask, uh, escalate something. So case resolution times, uh, inquiries quote response times, how fast can I get back to people with a good rate? Win rates um, is a good indicator that your rates are competitive or that you're offering good service. Um, it's, uh, you know, things like net promoter score. It's not my favorite met metric, but it's better than most of the other ones. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, yeah, so having good focus and direction on what are we trying to do, um, not taking on too many things. Um, hard for me because I like to do new things and take on a lot, but um, focus and direction is definitely a really important part of the culture. Uh, then um, the next piece is quality focusing on that. You know, it's part of the culture, but it also has to be like, okay, what are the initiatives? Like, what are we doing specifically mm -hmm. on that? 
Um, there, you know, I've said enough what those metrics are, and then like long lists of important uh, and well delegated initiatives on that. The third real focus area, so it's culture, it's quality of our operations and our and our business, you know, execution. Uh, third is really cost discipline. Um, we had accrued some bad habits. Many of those over the last decade of like kind of venture capital was came easily to Flexport, and we just um, I think we. I've never seen a company raise, you know, we've raised more money than almost any company and venture back company and um, probably more than any in supply chain. Uh, and I've never seen a company that managed to raise even any amount of money <clears throat> without like pretty quickly increasing their spend and losing a little bit of the financial discipline. Um, yep. That's not, uh, and, and then, and then that got worse over the last years. We really went very, very aggressively, Dave and I, uh, during our time working together, hired, a lot of engineers kind of went big, put pedal to the metal, um, increased our expense rate quite a bit. And we're having to unwind that and take things back down to a level where we're like, hey, let's live in let's live in reality. We don't sell Gucci handbags. We sell global logistics services. Uh, and people are going to, you know, you, you people are focused on, customers are focused on price. It's got to be affordable. They're, they're willing to pay for service and quality, but like ultimately you got to be in range on the price. And, um, and so that means any extra costs that we bear, we are going to have to increase our prices and be less competitive. So we've been going pretty hard at looking at every dollar we spend and what's that return on invested capital. How can I show that this adds value to the customers or is going to generate high returns, you know, from an investment standpoint uh, in the years to come? So that's kind of the three focus areas for me. And I'm spending all my time on that and almost no time on anything that isn't tied to one of those three things mm. of like delivering quality, make, uh, up, upgrading that culture of the company. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, cutting costs. Got it. So I'm going to step ahead here. And, um, over the last several years, uh, we've observed startups, some in our portfolio here at Dynamo, where they started with a transactional component, but they've also layered in SaaS. And now Flexport, you've championed software for a long time. And I'd be curious, how do you explain the value of your software alongside the transactional business that you lead with? Whether that's in kind of container logistics, kind of the, the omni-channel, the to be rebooted uh, digital freight brokerage, how do you explain that to uh, customers when you're interacting and engaging with them? Oh, well, you, you know, we, SaaS can mean a lot of things. Um, we don't have a subscription SaaS offering where you just like pay a monthly fee per seat yep. or, or some other thing. Um, we use SaaS, we use software uh, to do a few things. One, we have, we have we enhance our core offerings in logistics, and there's a million ways that software makes the logistics offerings better. Um, more visibility, more control, global supply chains and, and domestic ones as well, but especially global ones are fundamentally a communication challenge. Uh, you have the three kind of core flows of a supply chain. We, we usually just think of the goods flowing, but the data has to flow in parallel. Uh, and be made available securely with the right permissions to the right people in that chain to make decisions. And they have to be able to put data back in about what they have done, what they are going to do. Um, and ideally, it's not just people, but the assets, right? Like, and, and therefore, software talking to software to lower transaction costs and get more timely and accurate data out of those assets. Where is this thing? What's happening right now? Um, and so it's the, it's, it's the goods, it's the data, and then it's the cash flow. Uh, yep. The cash has to flow around. So you've got these three core flows of the supply chain and, and, and it's on a global basis, 24, seven, 365, all over the planet with thousands of companies. I mean, on the Flexport network, there's, there's probably close to, I don't want to overstate this. Well, now that you've got 400,000 truck drivers on mobile apps, um, I would say there's, yeah, you're probably approaching, you're over half a million different entities that were connected to Flexport. Yeah. It's pretty crazy to think about, you know, and, yeah. um, and of course that's stretching because you're like, okay, every single truck, but yeah, every single truck uh, that we've got. And then all the ships that we connect with, uh, all the, 
importers and exporters, the every, every the way Flexport's business model works is we'll we tend to sign up the importer, although we're increasingly signing up exporters around the world. Um, but we tend to historically have signed up like an importer in the United States, and we've got a really fast growing European business. Um, and we tend to sign up those companies there historically, and it's changing pretty fast with the rise of e-commerce and um, especially Chinese e-commerce. But but historically, since I you know I don't want to give a deep history, but let's say it all the last couple of decades, um, the importer of freight forward on freight has made about ninety percent of the purchase decisions about who the freight forwarder is. I think it's coming down. I hear it. I've seen stats that it's more like 80. I don't even know where that stat comes from. That's the, that's the scuttle button in the industry. That's our understanding of things. Um, and so, yeah, we tend to focus on the importer. But now at Flexport, when you sign up an importer, on average, we're getting 18 of their factories to come on board mm-hmm. and become users, right? And then if I get those users to import, to sign up more importers, et cetera. Um, and so, and then the way the business model works, the importers place orders to those factories through Flexport. Uh, Factsport, the, the, the factory is a user. Okay, hey, come on. All right, goods are ready. Come pick it up. Go and execute. Uh, go and execute the transaction. And so making that full end-to-end loop run smoother, more successfully. Your question is about SaaS. So like, yeah, there's a million things that software can do there. We do have elements of software that we charge for. Um, but we don't charge on a monthly subscription. It's a transaction-based service fee uh, looks a, mm. in that case, you know, there's some good, great software companies that are based like that. I think Stripe is a good classic yep. example. Um, Twilio is another good one for that. It's sort of like our order management software pay per transaction. Um, even customs brokerage, although there's definitely a human element, a lot of the way that we run our customs brokerage is with, with great automation and software. And we're, so we're charging per transaction. Um, but most of the way to think about Flexport is sort of managed services man, uh, where software makes things a lot better and, yeah. and gives us a competitive advantage. I think we're good at building software for global logistics and trade and financial services now. Um, the reason we build good software that solves users' problems is because we're living it ourselves. And I, I think that's what makes us different than a traditional software provider coming into this industry is that we feel that we're in these transactions so deep that we know better what that user experience should look like. Um, we're, we're better at building freight forwarding software than a freight forwarding tech company would be because we're talking to the end customer every day about what they need the dog as food well. Effectively. We're dog fooding it and we're building for the, the importers and exporters and not just for the freight forwarders. Uh, and yep. those are our customers. So it, it lets us create different classes of user experience than someone who's just like, oh, I make tools for freight forwarders. Mm, mm, that's, uh, that's super interesting. So, you know, through this year, being a supply chain focused investor, that's all we do here. We're getting questions about, hey, like whether supply chain startups that are like solely transactional. And when I say transactional, I don't mean the elements of software that you just outlined. I mean, I mean, kind of digital brokerage, forwarding, the like. Are these really good business models for VCs to ultimately fund? And those familiar with the cyclical nature of logistics are not necessarily shocked by the current market. Like these things kind of come in, in cycles. You have the macro cycle, you have freight cycles, but how well suited are VCs in the general audience for this? And are they right to kind of question, Hey, like, are these even VC fundable businesses? Cause I, I have a particular bias, but I, I'd be curious your take and, and your uh, rationalization of such. Well, investors are looking for return on invested capital. They're looking for low risk. Uh, and they're looking for a long duration, which is which is not um, immediately obvious. But good investors want long duration because you know you I, you can double my money in one year and then next uh, and then it's over. That's a short duration investment. Now I'm like, okay, great. What am I gonna now? I have to find a new investment. Much Pretty rather something risk. that doubles yep. my money every year for 20 years, right? I actually want a long duration as long as I'm getting that return on invested capital and I have low risk. Like those are your kind of three things that you want as an investor. Um, so. Return on investing capital, look, you don't want to be in an asset heavy business because assets have too low of a return on investment. So if you can avoid that, um, 
people focus a lot on margins, but you want to talk about free cash flow. And, you know, so it's a return on your dollar of investment in terms of free cash flow. Not in ter- Jeff Bezos says it the best. You can't eat a percentage point of margin, but you can eat from a dollar. Uh, and so, you know, you can have a 1% margin business on a trillion dollars is a good, who cares about the percentage point of margin? What you're looking for is fundamentally free cash that generates. Um, there are, Look, asset-heavy businesses tend not to generate the kinds of returns you need, or they do so with a lot of risk because you're putting leverage on these assets and you get boom and bust cycles. So I would avoid things that require lots of assets, um, but those that can, uh, but but a, a percentage point of margin is not an issue because even another way to think about margin, you know, I mentioned the dollars, but I like to think of margin as how many dollars of free cash flow do you generate per hour of labor in your team? Because if your technology and your business model allows you to take a new grad out of college or even someone with a high school degree and have them make a thousand bucks an hour worth of labor, I don't care what your percentage point of margin is. I don't consider that a low margin business. You're taking new grads and turning them into high end attorneys effectively, you know, from a business model. So that can be, that can be a very, very good business. Um, Freight forwarding in particular, not to encourage more entrance into the space, but it's, uh, you know, one of the highest return on investing capitals in Wall Street. You can ask financial investors. It is a, a cyclical business, but not, but not necessarily way less so than the asset owning sides of the business. Um, and uh, it's highly fragmented, 20,000 freight forwarders in the world. No one has more than a few percent. You know, it's, everyone's in single dig- digit percent. I think the number one forwarder has less than 5% of the yep. global market. Um it's something where technology can create a ton of value and competitive advantage. It's hard to build the tech, which is good. You make money doing hard things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, you know, I speak to Fred Ford because that's the thing I know the best. But in general, I think as long as you're focused on return on invested capital, now low risk means does mean avoiding assets. It means avoiding debt. means making sure you're not in a fad industry that this thing actually works. From that standpoint, supply chain is – well, it's it's been um, around with us since the dawn of time. Yeah, uh, people say people tell me it's the second oldest profession uh, is moving goods around the world. And you're you're um, from a st- you want to look at a, a, a cocky stick growth curve, pull up the growth of global trade, and I don't mean just since World War II. You've had four percent annual growth, which doesn't sound a lot to investors, but you've had four four percent annual growth for eight hundred years since the Mongol invasions, and that when you compound on a long duration like that, you go, oh wow, like this is something you can just count on. Now you got to grow faster than four percent, of course, but if your market's growing four percent, there's some ups and downs. And people are worried about the cyclicality. Oh, you know, what's happening right now? The prices are low or something. And that's fair. But, I mean, go look at the graph of trade and what's happened. You will not even notice. You will barely notice World War II Mm. when everybody was killing each other and tens of millions of people died and trade thought, I mean, it's a little blip and you just continue onward. And it was, you barely notice World War I. Uh, and, and don't tell me, oh, we're going through the worst time in all uh, you know human history like right now. We're not. Like we've literally had world wars uh, and the brink of the apocalypse and nuclear bombs were dropped. Like uh, trade and, is and enduring. Trade, it, it endures. So like it'll have cycle ups, ups and downs. There's blips. Like 2008 was pretty rough for the sector. The financial crisis, pandemic sent all kinds of gyrations through the, through the cycle. Um there will be more in the future, I'm sure. It, it, I'm not saying it's all up and to the right, but human beings fundamentally want to trade with each other. Mm-hmm. That's like, yeah. on a lot of sense, what makes us human that well, no well. other species is able to trade with each other and benefit from each other from specialization. Uh, we're the only species that does that. And that there, you can count on that trend. That's just something unique. Now, our governments and politics and Things are going to get in the way, yes, but humans will find a way. We always find a way to route around and find loopholes and opportunities, and they trade this rule so you can't trade with that country. Okay, you're going to trade with the other country and trade domestically or whatever, but 
it's it, it's certainly a great industry and, and one where tech can add a lot of value. So, in fact, to the extent that people don't like it as an investor is the reason to double down on it. You don't make money just chasing the herd and investing, as you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that's all well said. And I guess some of my takeaways are, listen, kind of this is enduring and, and hyper durable. But if you're not willing to have a truly long term mindset, Maybe this isn't for you because there will be some gyrations between here and there, but it's an amazing place to compound capital otherwise. Yeah, oh, it's definitely not a get rich quick scheme. No, you know what I mean. You're doing real world stuff. You have to actually add value. Like I, I tweeted yesterday about um, the role of blockchains and logistics, and like I saw that. <laughs> it, well, I, I, I'm a big fan of like new technologies and cryptocurrency, and I'm not saying that Bitcoin's bad. I think you should probably hold some Bitcoin in your portfolio. Like that's fine, but like from a logistics standpoint, any I, I think there might be use cases for a shared database that's neutral that we all put data into so we can get track and trace visibility and like not have it owned by one company. So that if that encouraged more, more companies to put their assets on them on the platform and let everybody track each other's assets, and it's, it's not held by one company and therefore people don't feel like, Hey, I'm giving my data away. And those people, that might be a use case. However, when you go and try to say, okay, what would be the value of the tokens that then pay out to the database providers, right. which is all of us participating, it would be so low that it takes away all the appeal of cryptocurrency of get rich quick. And then you're like, okay, who wants that? Like the whole point of, for a lot of people, the point of cryptocurrency and it's like, I'm going to get rich quick. And you're like, okay, sorry, that's not, that's not going to happen in, in global logistics. You're going to have to do something that's really hard. You're going to have to stay at it for a long time. You're going to have to have a good return on capital, which means you're not going to hire um, 500 engineers off venture capital and just pray that someday it works. Uh, you got to have a working business model pretty early in your life cycle um, and be very capital efficient, et cetera. So that'll probably discourage a lot of people, which again is a good reason to go into the space like because there'll be less competition. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I, I, I do want to touch on um, kind of pulling a, a prior thread. You just mentioned business models. Y you made the very intentional choice in while you deliver value through software, you price that and allow the exchange of value to be transactional. And Ryan, I've sat in boardrooms with portfolio companies that are doing really well have been able to solve a customer pain point through software, but get badgered as to why they're not growing SaaS or have priced their SaaS in a transactional manner. And I'd be curious, mm. kind of how did you deduce and come to the point that, hey, charging a flat fee per month or per year is not where we're best aligned. Actually, what's best is to do it in this more transactional nature, even if it is software oriented value. That would be, I um, think, not a, it, it's not a it's not a universal recommendation uh, by any means, right? Every business is different. Sure, I don't think people should change their decision. Something they learn on this podcast or any other. It's like you got to know your business way better than, than anybody else. I, by the way, you should know your business better than your investors know your business. That's your job as your CEO. So, uh, but listen, listen to everybody. But you don't have to do what they say. Um, the reason that I, for Flexport, believe that transaction-based and even logistic service-based business model is better than selling seats, and we, we had this debate. They're they're smart people at Flexport who believe we should just charge a seat license for everybody as an additional revenue stream that's dropped straight to the bottom line. I get the attractiveness from the investor standpoint. Like if you do that, it does not cost money. It, every dollar goes to the profit line. Um, the reason I, I think it's wrong for our business is because we're in a network effect business that every importer adds 18 exporters. And a lot of those exporters are now adding other importers. Uh, something currently it's only 8% of the importers that come. Uh, if I get an importer, they invite 18 exporters, only 8% uh, of those exporters add another importer. Mm. But guess what? That's more than a value of coefficient of 1.1. Uh, and so therefore you have viral growth uh, 
as if, and especially if those importers then invite 18 more exporters. Oh my goodness. You're going to go crazy. Right. See, yeah. um, so I don't think, I think that if I charged a subscription fee and it turned off some percentage of users who didn't want to come on to the platform because they don't want to pay that fee, then I'm not getting the other 18 factories on board. Uh, and it dampens the network effect. So that's, that's a simple way to, to think about it mathematically. Um, Another way is that, hey, we're really a land and expand business. Um, we're very different than an SAP or an Oracle, which I guess those are also land and expand businesses. But the first landing piece is like a many year implementation to transform your entire company and change everything about how you do business. Um, and it, it, in in our business, like, hey, the the transaction-based nature of the thing is like, look, software is free. Come on, I'll get you an account right now. Uh, ship something. See that it goes well. Ideally, I get you to ship enough things that we can have um, some statistically valid hypothesis testing about our, whether it's our transit time, our price against your index, the responsiveness, some of our quality metrics, some of the things we're trying to achieve for you, the way that data flows uh that you can trust it all. Um, and so the, um, and, and I, you know, as we know in statistics, you need at least 30 in a sample, 30 uh, items in your sample to have statistically valid out output. So that's a nice sales pitch. I got to get 30 shipments, not one, but like ideally we're getting, we're getting some test here. And if it goes well, then we'll do more and more and more and more and more. Uh, and we have 20 different products, maybe more depending on how you want to define a product. But if you look at the top navigation at flexport.com, you'll see like at least 20 offerings mm -hmm. of different things we can do. Um, I'm trying to get you to do a bundle. The more of those things you do, they all connect together and you add more value. You can buy any one of them modularly. In fact, even um, yesterday we launched our uh, carbon calculator that you can now track emissions on any global logistics shipment that is shipped with anybody else in a really simple form. And you can, it's free. You can upload a CSV file of your shipments and get back. Here's our best estimate of the carbon emissions for that. So some of the stuff is just like, you don't even have to ship something, Yeah. but ideally we're getting you in the door, finding some hypothesis for how we can create value. We're testing that statistically and proving that we do a good job. Then you're doing more and more and more. And if I just charge you a seat license, you're like, I don't yeah, I think I'll just say no to that seat. Like, I don't know. I, I, I get very frustrated by software companies with like very expensive price tags who won't let you try it out, who make you do a Zoom call. And then uh, and then they want six thousand dollars a year before I've tried anything as a buyer of that. I'm like, how about I just Doesn't don't buy this? You, you yeah. know, I'd rather test something and use it out. So um, you you mentioned uh, crypto, which was uh, the last kind of tech hype cycle that we've lived through. We're currently in a period of AI LLM mania. How do you see I'm not anti-crypto. I want to be clear. I just think for when crypto has to tie to the real world, you're then trusting real world people to enter data correctly into your database. And so if I'm going to trust a forklift driver that they loaded that container with the stuff they said they were loading it with, I might as well trust the database provider. Like the sure. point of crypto is that it's trustless and you can do business with people you don't know. Guess what? That's illegal in global trade. Yep. And you will be risking your life because if you import something from you, someone you don't know, yes, it's illegal too. If it's cocaine, you're going to jail for the rest of your, you know, for a very long period of time. And you really, you want to trust, you want to just do business with people you don't know. No, you do not. I promise you. Like, yeah. No, I think your, your, your observation criticism of, of, of blockchain is well placed and, and kind of how we view the world and their rebuttals to it, all, all that. But thinking about kind of, you, you have LLMs that have really taken the world by storm in the last 12 months. How do you see that improving? As you mentioned before, at the start of the conversation, software helps us deliver value and become more efficient for what our customers need us to do. How do you see that playing out? Because at Dynamo, we think like we're in this very novel and really interesting period where a lot can actually be delivered in a more automated and high quality way. 
there are caveats, things like hallucinations and such. But how are you thinking through it? Um, we're finding, I, I would say we've had more progress, certainly more promise, let's say. Like more promising real world actual results in automation as a result of large language models and and other it misses large language models. There's some, we do a lot of other types of mach, machine learning, but we've been doing that for a long time. But the large language model uh, breakthroughs that we've had in the last three months have have completely changed my view about the possibility of automating uh, the core operations of a global logistics provider. Completely changed my view. I was pretty jaded. I thought you'd make incremental improvements, a few percentage points a year, which is pretty good. If you, again, you do that for 800 years, it looks like a Silicon Valley yeah. hype, hype cycle. Uh, you do that for a few decades, you'd be very good. And I, so I believed that deeply on just like kind of core software based automation. But um, with LLMs, you're seeing that you can just do, do stuff and, and implement it in a week where it was taking. Um, a, a six month project um, mm. that uh, and the reason that that's working really well for Flexport. And I think we have competitive advantage doing this is, well, we have data at the level of like an incumbent because we are now we're the seventh largest freight forwarder on the world's largest trade link. Uh, we're the third largest freight forwarder in, uh, of, in the United States um, of the American freight forwarders. And, so that gives you kind of the data scale to train models, to make decisions that specific types of models that you can do with this is routing. What route should we do? Which, which specific ship should I put this container on to achieve the transit time that my customer is trying to achieve in a very dynamic world? Um, and that's one example. Uh, fundamentally where LLMs really work. And you mentioned the hallucinations where they sort of, where they don't work. Um, what we're finding is that this, if you can give it a very simple and discrete task, it does a really good job yep. uh, with very high accuracy. And this is where I think we, not only we have competitive advantage around data, but we've spent 10 years making uh, the tasks of freight forwarding incredibly discrete, simple uh, breakdown. Yeah, really yep. Instead of moving a container from door to door and assigning that to a smart human, which is how freight forwarding has always worked um, or a couple of humans on different sides of the planet. Uh, ours breaks it into a very simple task with nice custom workflow for each task. It's like 104 on ocean freight, typical container. I want to say there's 146 tasks that have to get completed in our system. Um, and each one has a really nice web form and some degree of automation that's been there for a long time of extracting data like OCR data out of a customs document or something. But now we're just assigning week after week. They're like, oh, we automated this task now. Uh, and every week in the product announcements channel, we're putting out stuff. It's like, oh, wow, they automated that. They did that. They did that. Uh, so we'll see. I, you know, it's still, it hasn't made a meaningful impact yet financially because it's just a few months of work. We, we were early users of the open AI. AI uh, friends with the OpenAI team, on a, a number of, uh, including CEO. So no, we were able to get early access to the, a, the APIs there. Uh, also working with an, a few other companies um, that that are doing large language model, either a layer on top or make their own foundational models. And they're, yeah, the results are really powerful. So I, I'm very, very optimistic on that part. Um, to give you that ship routing, in fact, that's M that's machine learning we built in house, uh, and I don't even think that's large language model. It's more classical machine learning um, optimization work, so to speak. Yeah, um, what we do there to give you an example of what it's still a form of AI. I mean, we used to call mm -hmm. that AI yeah. before large language models came around. Um, what we do there, why you need tech for this? So let's say I've got a container that's going from Shenzhen to Long Beach. Uh, simple problem. Shenzhen to Southern California. Sounds like a simple problem. It is basically. Uh, I've got two ports to choose from on the destination side, LA and Long Beach. Uh, I then have a number of contracts. I think we have like eight different carriers that we work with on that on that core trade lane. Um, we then each one has multiple strings. That's the kind of series of ports that the ship will stop at along the way. Uh, each of those strings has an expected transit time, which may which is almost I, certainly different than the one that they publish from the carrier. 
So we have to build database. Not and look, it's hard. It's hard because there's weather events, there's yeah. court calls, there's issues. Like it's life. Um, but but you. So we build our machine learning models that predict what that transit time will actually be based on historicals um, and based on things that are happening, the weather and everything else. Um, and so then you have an expected transit time from that sailing. Now there's this dynamic part, all of that's dynamic, but easy, relatively easy to model. Then there's this very dynamic thing of, um, well, how much space do you have? You've got contracts with these carriers. How much allocation do you have on each string each day, each week? Uh, and then your factories, your customers are pushing the, the cargo ready date constantly. Yep. Uh, we current run rate, actually this date is a month old. I haven't looked at it this week, but uh, is 1600 times a week, we get uh, a change to the cargo ready date for one of the containers we're moving. Um, the fact, you know, production's hard. Mm -hmm. Not ready this week, it'll be ready next week. Um, when humans are doing this, there's two ways to do it. One is you cancel that booking and you place a new booking. Um, in fact, that's what every freight forwarder does. They place multiple bookings with different carriers and they're canceling them left and right to make sure that, but when the, when the booking finally does show up, <laughs> when it does show up, they have it. And there's no charges for cancellations in ocean freight. Um, non-enforceable contracts and on a week-to-week -week basis they just 30 percent of all containers that are booked with an ocean carrier get canceled it's crazy um what flexport does is we don't do that we we uh we place fewer bookings we're not double booking with carriers we're placing the right amount of bookings based on our expected cancellation rates from our customers and then when we get a cancellation instead of canceling that booking we look across our network and our software does, machine learning does this 10 times a day to find another container from a future sailing that I can pull forward. If that car goes ready, I pull it forward. This machine learning imp has improved our transit time by 20%, reduced our cancellation rate with the carriers down to the industry lowest. So it's around 10%, depends on the string. But we're canceling like one third the containers that our competition yeah. cancels makes the carriers think we're the most we are the most reliable freight forwarder from a carrier perspective then they reward us because if 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 you're an ocean carrier put yourself in their shoes 30% of your containers are getting canceled what are you going to do you got to overbook yeah. no yep. choice you have to overbook your ship and then you end up rolling uh, when kind and of then times you roll the cargo tight. yep it's exactly, you know, but people who saw this, the airlines, like when we were kids, like they were constantly making announcements. I need, I'm looking for volunteers. I got to bump passengers, but they use data science and, and, and really just statistics to, to correctly over, they overbook airplanes too, but they're pretty good at predicting who's not, how many people are going to show up mm -hmm. and make sure. And then they use it with the rewards program so that if first class passengers book, they move an economy class person up there into that seat. Um, and so it's kind of a similar idea, right? Like if I've got faster services, there are fast boats across the Pacific that don't make as many port calls. They're not faster ships. They just don't make all the calls along the way. Yep. So they're faster. And if somebody cancels on that, I'm rewarding somebody else with a really fast shipment. Uh, yep. And they get thrilled, right? And it's like getting upgraded to first class. So um, these are things that machine learning can do in this industry. That, But you've got to be building your own software to do this. If you're just relying on a third-party SaaS operating system for your freight comp forward, if you're a freight forwarding business running someone else's software, like it's nice, it's cheap. You don't have to hire all the engineers that we do, but you, you innovate. Lose. Yeah, you innovate at the pace of your software provider instead of going, "Hey, let's go tackle right. this problem right here and now and, and make it work." Yep. Yep. So I'm gonna kind of. Uh uh land us here to uh to the finish line i have, I have two things i want to pick your brain on before we part ways first nearshoring everybody wants to talk about it they love talking about it what's the data actually saying from the position you're in is this actually happening where is it happening what type of stakeholders are actually doing this um it's absolutely happening america is having a manufacturing boom right now um I've seen stats showing it's the, as big as the manufacturing boom we had in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so there's absolutely much more manufacturing to be done in the United States, Mexico as well. 
uh, doesn't mean that trade's not happening because all the inputs from the, you know, the manufacturing process are still coming from overseas. Uh, not all, but many. Um, America, but America, by the way, is the least dependent company country in the world on global trade. We're number one in global trade, but we also do, as a percentage of our economy, it's the lowest of any com- country in the world. Um, mm. We're very fortunate. Ge- we have the greatest geography on planet Earth, and this is not just because yep. I'm American. It's indisputable. Uh, with the, the, the level of natural resources, the number one producer of food, we have more navigable rivers than all the other countries in the world combined. Yeah. Um, we have more oil production. Mm-hmm. We, I think we have more oil than Russia and Saudi combined. Yeah. I mean, we're like number one by a lot in the oil production. We don't export that much because we consume so much, but um, we're pretty autonomous and depend on trade way less than other economies. We're still the number one importer of goods. Uh, because we're the richest country in the world and we can afford it. Like to spend. Um, uh, yeah, man, the American consumer is just really special. Uh, <laughs> we, we consume 70% of our um, GDP is consumption. Yep. China is like 40, I want to say. Europe is like 55. So we're the American consumer is the backbone. We like to buy stuff. Uh, it's kind of awesome. As a, as a business person, you can find people to buy your stuff. Um, but... Uh, Trade is not going down. Trade, you had a boom in the pandemic where trade went crazy. It's back. It is down from that level, but it's back down to kind of historical. I think you'll see it rise on historical levels. A lot of it is div- companies are diversifying manufacturing away from one one from one place, and that one place had been just China. Um, a lot of that's reaction to tariffs. People will, you know, supply chains are set up to be low cost. That's the reason you put it in China in the first place. Uh, so tariffs definitely have a big impact, but but frankly, Chinese labor costs have gone way up. Um, labor costs in Mexico are now about half of what they are in China, and that is that was not the case five ten years ago. Um, well, I lived in China eighteen years ago for a few years running supply chain, and that in, the, in, the, in the, since uh, since two thousand, the labor cost in China has gone up by fourteen x since the year two thousand, and that's um, good for China. You know, their people are getting paid more. I don't, people are like looking at this consumers. like, <laughs> perhaps, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's good for the world. People should make yeah. more money. Um, but there are cheaper, much cheaper places. Mexico is a cheaper place now. It's not necessarily a better quality manufacturing. Chinese has incredible manufacturing capabilities and quality. So people, many factories are still finding that that's the best place to make their product because their the manufacturing capabilities are really good. Uh, but people are diversifying a lot. Um, Vietnam is going through a manufacturing boom. Um, the infrastructure is just not there to support it. That sounds like a generic term, but there's the two biggest cities in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi, are not connected by a freeway. Yeah. You're talking about a two-lane road with stoplights sure. the whole yeah. way. Um, uh, this is uh, – the ports are not connected. You've got to – Vietnam is fortunate they have a river network like, like the U- U.S. does so that you can w- – a lot of flex ports, container shipping – in Vietnam, it's it's our second biggest origin is is Vietnam. A lot of it goes by river barge yeah. to the seaport because the trucking is network's not there. Um, India has got a, a is growing really fast in manufacturing, so you're seeing a diversification as well as near shoring. I don't think the near shoring is um, to that much to save on supply chain costs. Like to be Sprint honest, shipping sovereignty things like that. Maybe it's quality. Uh, s- certain areas, it's it's uh, their incentives, chips, act, uh, making semiconductors yeah. in the U.S. There's other things that are government incentivized, um, but it's it's not about logistics costs or, or even transit time, prob- because it's cheaper to ship a container from Vietnam to California than it is to drive a truck from Mexico to California. Uh, much cheaper. It's cheaper to. It's cheaper to ship something across the ocean. It's ocean freight so cheap. Um, I mean, it's about half the price to ship a container if you're going to one of the coasts. And even inland rail, if you're going from Asia to Chicago, we have about half the price of shipping a container from Monterey to mm-hmm. Chicago. Yeah. I mean, it's, it varies It varies week to week. But, um, so, you know, it looks nice on the map. Look how close it is. But trucking is just not that efficient. Uh, and, uh, and rail networks are kind of – difficult to work with uh, if you're just shipping a single container. So, um, so yeah, I think 
the, the supply chain are going to be dynamic. They're going to respond to labor price tariffs and everything else, but people, they're just going to, that's always the case, right? Like it used yep. to be, we bought cheap stuff from Japan and then it went to Korea and then it went to China and now it's Vietnam, but it'll keep moving all the time. Uh, and hopefully the result is that people in these countries are making more money. I mean, if, if, if a country is suddenly not competitive because their labor cost is too high, good for them. Like their labor costs went up. That means human beings are getting paid more. Well, you know, in, in, in thinking about those local economies, they're kind of going through a, a, an industrial revolution of sorts. So as their kind of economies emerge to saying, hey, we're no longer kind of the cheapest place to make a certain item, that equally triggers different types of opportunities. Because to your point, the population is earning more. So maybe they're also spending more and that unlocks different different things for places like Vietnam, India, so on. I mean, you, you hope so. That I think that's the bet those the politicians of these countries are making. It's been hard yeah. to get um, certain countries to spend more on consumption. The American consumer is just a special. We're just a different kind of people, apparently. Like we get, we spend more than we make, uh, and that mm-hmm. that fuels the economy. Uh, and in in Asia, they save more than they make. You know what I mean? They save yeah. more than they spend. There's a different, different culture cultural. there, and that yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, good for them. But it, and that that savings has to generate investment. And that can lead to overinvestment. We talked about asset bubbles, but, you know, maybe you build too much infrastructure. Uh, yeah. And um, right now in Vietnam, though, return on infrastructure investment is very high. We, we, we're we working. I mean, I love the fact that we do all this barge shipping, one, because it's cool. But it's like, hey, you know what? That's a very creative solution yeah. to the lack of infrastructure we got. We're working in the river ports and shipping in the Mekong Delta and stuff. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and in the U.S., we can certainly learn from that because while we have an extensive waterway, I personally think that we still don't utilize it to the best of our capabilities. It's it's utilized. um, The Mississippi River Network is incredible. It's utilized a ton for uh, ag exports, for energy, bulk kind of bulk commodities flowing out that down out out there in New Orleans. Um, way underutilized for container shipping is basically almost none there's like one or two services moving a couple hundred teus at a time uh and it's not used to my knowledge for to kind of replace domestic trucking shipments but it absolutely could be if you go look at that map you can cover you could build huge lane networks uh you know right from ohio the Ohio River all the way out up the Missouri River, up the Mississippi River, through the Great Lakes, down to New Orleans. I mean, it's an incredible network, very carbon efficient, very cheap. It'll be a little slower, but it'll be a lot cheaper. Uh, I think that's a pretty exciting opportunity, but it's a little bit asset heavy. I'm not sure it's venture. You, you want someone who's got a, a bit of a lower return, but lower risk. I mean, you should, it would make money for sure. It'd be yeah. very interesting to build. Yeah. It'd be a fun fun company to build. So my final question for you, we're sitting here at the start of the year. We have 12 months ahead of us. Any hot takes for 2024? Yeah, well, in the logistics world, um, it's always the case that you got to be ready for stuff that you that I will not be predicting on this podcast. It's a crazy world. Uh, two days ago, or maybe it was three, I can't keep track, um, the, the um, Yemeni rebels – Rebel Army. These are not like just like ragtag guerrillas. They're like a well-funded army unit. Uh, Civil War fired missile and hit uh, hit a ship. Mm-hmm. Um, most of these targets have been Israeli-owned or Israeli-affiliated ships, but this was just a random ship I owned in Malaysia or something. I forgot. Not definitely not. Uh, it was just targeting shipping. That is a very big deal. If you lose the if the insurance companies pull out or dramatically raise rates for going through the Suez, you're going to, um, you'll have to go around the Cape, uh, for these big ships to go around the Cape. First off, just doing that, it takes much longer, therefore reduces capacity of the network. Uh, also they, I, my understanding is the, the, the ocean is so heavy. The seas are so heavy down there that you can't load the ships nearly as full. It's one uh, of those dangerous container. routes to kind of circumvent. Containers start falling off. I've never mm-hmm. been down to that part of the – well, I have, but not on a ship. Um, and um, so that would – it only takes a handful of containers. Seven containers uh, fill a 747, and there's about 607 cargo 747s in the world, if, if, I, if my memory serves me. 
So it wouldn't take a lot of container. You know, a container ship holds over 10,000 container, 40 footers, the big ones. So it wouldn't take a lot of um, cargo diverted from the ocean because it's less reliable or more expensive uh, to just jam the air cargo network completely and um, drive prices to the moon. Uh, we've got a drought in the Panama Canal that's already shifted tons of East Coast volume to the West Coast. West Coast, in September, I didn't see the stats for October, November, to be honest. Right? They're not coming to my mind. I'm sure I saw them. But uh, September was the biggest month in the history of L.A. Long Beach. It's a big narrative violation. If you're like, oh, trade's yeah. down. But like, nope. Uh, all the East Coast volume is being diverted to the West Coast because of the Panama Canal. Um, East Coast, you've got the ILA, which is the labor union representing the, work, the longshoremen on the East Coast. Contract comes up and they're saying they will not work without a contract. I think it was September of next year that it's yep. getting negotiated. Um, that's a big deal, obviously. Uh, and I'm not sure what the carrier's view of it is. They might be willing to uh, call the bluff. Um, so that's all Oceanside Air related these these markets are related because when the ocean breaks down people switch to air and there's not a, there's not a lot of air capacity in the world relatively um w- right now the stat that i learned recently that kind of blew my mind the biggest was that uh between 30 and 50 percent depending on the airline 30 30 to 50 percent of the cargo getting moved from asia to north america is e-commerce parcels uh right now i mean that's up and and the leading company in that team who is projecting i heard i think they published this like over like triple digit growth 100 percent growth um the the some of these companies are public t- you know tiktok um there's there's dozens of these companies not to mention just the fedex ups of the world that, that 30 percent going is with with that kind of growth Air freight prices, you know, you're if you're in that business, and a lot of that's peak season because these are kind of like e-com, therefore very much tend to be tied to Christmas buying season. Um, you, you see very, very high air prices at, at the moment. Uh, and I predict next year, if you need air capacity at peak season, you're going to want to sign some longer-term contracts. contracts. And you probably overpay during the slack season to make sure that you have that space at peak because the econ boom is, is crazy right now. Um, so yeah, like, but Hey, I get, I bet you anything. If we come back and come on, I'll, I'm happy to come back on the podcast than ever, but I bet if I come back 12 months from now, we'll be like, Oh yeah, Ryan, you didn't even predict that thing. Cause I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen then. With that, man, I certainly appreciate you making your first appearance. Hopefully not the last here on the future supply chain. We covered a lot of ground and, I think uh, ultimately for people, there's probably no more exciting spot than supply chain to be spending your time, to your point, if you're interested in business. There's a backstage it's, pass to that. It's a free MBA you get to go. I mean, it's not free because you got to work your butt off, but uh, you're going to learn more working in a supply chain company about how businesses are run than you would at any business school. Um, mm-hmm. you, you just will because you're seeing everything. First of all, within your company, you're learning the sales and marketing and hopefully the finance and accounting functions. Uh, and then you're learning about everybody else's business too. And how yep. are they making money? What the cost of inventory, you can see it real time. Oh man, this is expensive. And if it sits there unsold, it's really expensive. And I'm financing that inventory and inventory is nothing more than dollars that have been converted to a different form. You can start to think about interest rates, success. Like it, it it'll teach you everything about business and i don't think there's the world is a super interesting place but there's a lot there's not a lot of disciplines that are more interesting than than business thanks for watching follow us at dynamo.vc for all the latest episodes we'll see you next time